This is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a youth ministry podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. This season, we are focusing on discipleship that forms Christ-like characteristics. And this episode is all about humility. We'll answer questions like, what is humility? And how do we cultivate humility in our students? But before we dive in, let's listen to what young people had to say. My name is Samantha. I am 14 years old. I am Frank. And I am 13. What does humility mean to you? I mean, I always thought humility meant like being humble, you know, sort of. So like my friend doesn't like have like high expectations of himself, but he says that he has lots to grow. So in a way, I feel like to him, he like he's very humble because he knows he's like he has room to grow and has potential but he doesn't like see himself as like an arrogant person. I don't see him as an arrogant person because he's, he understands like what the word humble means. Do you think that you are humble? I would say, yeah, for the most part, yes, but I definitely do at times struggle with that. Cause I feel like for me, when stuff is going bad, I might, I naturally like turn to God. I'm like, you know, help me through this, please keep me safe. But I feel like when everything is going like perfectly, it's sometimes difficult for me to remember, like, I still need God, even though things are going well. I'm like, he still helped me get here. Yeah, I'm like, I still need him no matter what. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Rosalyn Hernandez. I am Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager and Content Producer at the Fuller Youth Institute. And hello, I'm Giovanni Panginda, the social media lead at FYI, and we are your hosts for this episode. And today we are going to get started with a characteristic that can feel like a catch-22. Humility. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Humility is especially difficult um, to instill in ourselves and our students because we are said to live in this entitled culture. So today's guests will help us better understand humility, provide some examples of what humility looks like, and explain why it is so beneficial to both our students and ourselves as leaders. And of course, we'll also talk about some thoughtful and practical ways to help teenagers cultivate humility. That's right. Our guest is Rich Biodas. And in addition to being a husband and a father of two, Rich is a lead pastor of New Life Fellowship, which is a large multicultural church in Queens, New York. He's also a speaker and the author of Good and Beautiful and Kind and The Deeply Formed Life. Rich, welcome. So good to be with you both. Thanks for the kind invitation. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Yeah, very happy. We want to start with something a little bit more personal. Do you remember a time when young people taught you something about humility? You know, I think one of the ways that I understand humility, and we'll get into some of this, is uh, through the language of curiosity. And I I think those who are most humble are often most curious. And Mm. uh, I have seen many uh, young folks, uh, whether they're middle schoolers or even elementary, who when they come to me with their questions, for me, that's really a great expression of what humility is as opposed to having all the answers. That's mm, right. And I love, love that you brought up I curiosity. Curiosity for me is also one of the, a healthy curiosity, I think, is mm. one of the things that really helped me think about humility. Mm. I'm a youth pastor on the weekend, and I asked this question actually to one of my students, and one of my students quoted um, Kendrick Lamar and said that humility is sit down, be humble. <laughs> <laughs> When our research team asked youth uh, leaders about humility, it was it was very difficult to come up with a concrete definition. I know you shared a little bit about curiosity, but do you have like another formal definition of humility or um, other examples that you you may have? Well, first of all, I think humility is, in many ways, it's the gateway virtue to all the other virtues. So if if you can get humility, or at least begin to grow in it. Uh, It opens your life to uh, really uh, achieving and embodying other virtues. The other challenge with humility, however, is 
once you think you have it, it's at that moment that you lose it. So for example, if someone says, I'm feeling more compassionate, but if you say, you know what, I'm feeling really humble these days. It's like, uh, I don't know, man. It just it, it hits different. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> there's a guy named John Dixon who wrote a book on humility. And he, and he said that humility is a willingness to hold power in service of others. So that's one way of understanding humility. The other way I think about humility, however, is that humility is not just simply... Uh, doing a lowly task, which is how many folks understand humility, but it is the hard task of lowering our defenses, uh, which is to say that the most humble people are often the least defensive people, and that our defensiveness is often a sign of either great pride or great shame, which are two enemies to cultivating profound humility in our lives. It's this act of consistently lowering our defenses in service of love. Wow. I want to um, create more nuance to, uh, to the word humility then, because there's aspects of our students' realities like language, uh, cultural background, immigration stories that kind of, yeah, very nuance the, the, the meaning of, of humility. And Rich, since you are uh, leading a multicultural church, where diversity in cultures and first languages is is a lived reality. Um, what are a few practical lessons um, you've learned about humility as a leader from leading in that kind of context and then also interacting with people from, from the, those diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, you know, New Life Fellowship Church, the church I've been at for 15 years and as the lead pastor for the last 10 years, when you have, you know, 75 nations represented, you're going to find all kinds of varying degrees of understanding as it relates to something like humility. And so one of my tasks, first of all, is to, in many ways, reframe what humility is for a very diverse community. Humility is often seen as self-deprecation or a, a low view of one's importance. Humility is often seen in many uh, first-generation immigrant spaces that humility equals passivity but like i cannot take up any space and at its worst uh humility means that i'm a doormat much of my work as a pastor is number one helping people to name what humility isn't i recently posted something on instagram about a conversation i typically have when i train preachers preachers who tend to be super religious or super spiritual the response is usually like, oh, it was all God. And I've trained people to say, thank you. And the reason I say that is because the whole it's all God kind of thing uh, can sound like humility. Uh, but to distance ourselves from our gifts is not humility. And so we must begin to take ownership of our gifts. God put us here to take up space in a way that leads to uh, justice and love and encouragement and all the rest. I think that's really helpful to think about, you know, the gifts, even the experience, the knowledge that we bring to situations or to to people, the talents that we give and knowing the value that we add to, to situations or things is not a bad thing. It, it really helps us to appreciate yes. that other people also bring value and knowledge. You know, the, the humility in there comes in a different way as of like, oh, we all have something to contribute to the body of God. Yes, absolutely right. And, you know, which leads me to like, what is then the accurate sense of how is humility to be understood? And C.S. Lewis is typically attri given attributed this quote, humility is not thinking less of myself, it's thinking of myself less. That's humility. Humility is a willingness not to take up the kind of narcissistic space and the and the self congratulatory space and the the space that um, centers ourselves in all things. I think that transitions us really well into a, this next question, which is about perceptions. Thinking of ourselves less in the context of this question might be more related to our culture. There's certainly an ethnocentricity in American culture today. It can be said that entitlement is a posture that opposes humility. We center ourselves and we think that we deserve certain things. And there's a perception that Gen Z or younger generations are entitled, both as a pastor and a father of young people. 
you have firsthand experience into some of what this generation has gone through um, as a father, you know, seeing your children. What can you tell us about this assumption? First of all, entitlement, you know, is this felt sense that I deserve special treatment and uh, that I'm owed certain things because of who I am and, you know, whether they be perks, advantages, privileges, et cetera. But as it relates to uh, Gen Z, there was a time when we did not have the level of nonstop flow of information and I could just play with my little toys and not have to worry about what's going on in the news. And so that's the reality of people who are part of this generation. Uh, but I think it's this false idea that Gen Z folks do, don't work hard, that they want special treatment. And I think what the Gen Z folks have embodied, I think, and have led the way in is understanding what resilience and sustainability looks like and prioritizing mental health and self-awareness. Uh, and so I don't see those things as entitlement. I see those things as stewardship of our bodies, stewardship of our minds. And I think previous generations, which are so accustomed to uh, not paying attention uh, and I think uh, this generation has said, no, no, this is something that needs to be normalized and prioritized. Uh, and so while some, I think, see that through the lens of entitlement, I, I, I think that's very wrong because more than anything, I think Gen Z is helping us to see what resilience and sustainability actually looks like. There's a very real sense of vulnerability in there that mm -hmm. uh, this generation has, that previous generations maybe not they didn't want to have, but they weren't given the space to have. Mm -hmm. When you talk about this generation, I think of my younger sister who was in middle school. And in Christmas, we had a vacation. It was a girl's trip. And my mom was like, okay, everybody, like, let's get up early. And my younger sister, she needs a lot more sleep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she was not having it. She was like, I, I don't want to get up <laughs> right now. <laughs> she was getting a little grumpy. And she said, it's vacation. Vacation is for rest. Like vacation is for sleeping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and at that moment, you know, yes. we had to like say like, you are right. We have this like go, go, like, um, type of thinking maybe in mm -hmm. older generations like this hustle culture from you know we're immigrants we got to work hard we got to survive do better things than our parents or you know just we you have to be doing something like as algo you know yeah but she was like hey like let's take a break this place is not gonna leave like we need to go at our mm -hmm. own pace and at a healthy rhythm yeah and I love that. What that speaks to is I think this generation has a better grasp, not a perfect grasp, but a better grasp as to what integration looks like. Uh, what does it mean to be integrated with our bodies? What does it mean to be integrated with our uh, psychology? What does it mean to be integrated uh, with creation? What seems like soft to some generations is actually stewardship and integration and I think we have lots to learn for sure. As a leader, why is it important for us to understand young people and not believe these kinds of myths or assumptions or have these kinds of assumptions about them? Connecting this to humility. Humility is a recognition that I don't see everything. In fact, I don't see many things the way I think I do uh, with the level of clarity. I don't know everything. And so at the core of humility is a willingness, back to curiosity, to open myself up to another's perspective. One of the great gifts of the congregation I lead, we have you know, very, lots of ethnic, racial, cultural diversity, socioeconomic diversity, but it is the generational diversity that has been such a gift because I'm able to now see matters and issues in ways uh, with a perspective that I've never had before. At the core of humility, if, if leaders want to cultivate humility, it begins by us listening deeply and confessing that we don't know it all, we don't see it all in the way that we think we do. Any leader who doesn't, who refuses to do that actually is setting up for their own demise because um, they're just assuring themselves that they're not going to be able to connect with and reach uh, the generations that are behind them. So I, I see it as the, the, the very fruit of humility to be curious and inquisitive, especially as we're talking about 
listening to folks in emerging generations. There's a saying in Spanish that goes, cuando tú vas, yo ya vengo. When you're going, I'm already on my way back. So it's like mm. saying, like, I already know the path that you're going through. Um, but you know, as you're, we're saying, like, maybe we don't know everything about <laughs> what these young people are going through. And, and being humble about it really helps us connect with them. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I just think about, like, I didn't have to do active shooter drills at school the way That's my exactly younger right. sister does, you know. Um, I don't, I don't, I didn't have to go through the pandemic and, and spend mm -hmm. years of my social development in my room looking at a computer. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right. And, yeah, that's right. And maybe older folks also experience hardships right now. You know, we all went through the pandemic, but there's something about the, the way pe some people are already established. They've already been through development that helped them mm -hmm. be more stable at facing it um resilient yeah, yeah, yeah. have be more resilient and and having less being less impacted by it so yeah. i have an eight-year-old son who's turning nine this year is going to be the first year because of uh in new york how uh, virtual uh education and and, and the social distancing and all that this is going to be the first year that he's going to actually have friends over for his birthday Uh, at nine years of age, and uh, I think about his, uh, the way that he's had to socially navigate the world as a six, seven, eight-year-old, uh, and the way that I had to, so much different, and so um, lots that we can learn and, and lots that we must be mindful of in terms of especially the level of disruption and disorientation that the world has experienced the last couple of years. So um, I'm going to admit that I have been following your Instagram for about a year and a half, um, and I've watched you preach online. And the fact that I was uh, in Queens about two weeks ago and just walking, you know, with the area in which you minister and just kind of really, you know, understanding more as a Californian, <laughs> uh, the, the, the things that you have talked about on your Instagram um, and uh, diversity and, and all that, like... Um, I also com come to understand that you are you are someone um, as, as a leader who is all about uh, contemplative spirituality, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see it in the DNA of, of New Life Fellowship. I have a friend named Fiel who goes to New Life Fellowship, and we've talked about this. Um, and you preached about it. Uh, you even write about it. Uh, so, so thinking about uh, contemplative practices and youth ministry. Do you have any suggestions that can help like youth leaders like me, um, especially cultivate a posture of humility in ourselves and our students? If leaders want to cultivate humility, it starts with finding our identity in the love of God. And the way we find that identity in the love of God is by beholding Jesus. Meditate on the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus as a Christ follower on a regular basis. Those who are poor in spirit who recognize their utter dependence upon God Now, no, I don't have to live my life proving who I am to others, nor do I need to protect anything. And if humility is about the lowering of our defenses, to lower that requires a, a level of prayer and stillness to root our identity in the love of God and not in anything else. That's not marked by transactionalism. That's not marked by, I need to say certain things in a, with a certain level of intensity and in prayer so that God can do what I want God to do. Can we pray in such a way that's marked by communion and being with God, not simply trying to get something from God? And I think that has a way of having rippling effects into the rest of our lives. Mm, that's really great that you talk about prayer. Um, and I'm thinking of Like, how do we teach young people to pray, right? Um, and, and specifically, solitude and quiet. Yeah. There's a really great practice of just presence. So just not like, you don't have to bring words to this prayer. You know, we just ask your students to close their eyes or to, and to like imagine that they are sitting in a room and like Jesus is there and it's up to them to just be present in that space with God or with Jesus and to let God 
be present with them and they don't have to bring anything to God. They can just be held by God in that space. Um, yeah, that's, I think sometimes, um, we forget about the different kinds of prayers that we can do. <laughs> it's so true. And in order to get, because for me, the vast majority of the way that I pray is in silence. But in order to do that, it requires such a reframing of that moment because you have to reframe distractions. I used to think that being distracted in prayer meant that I was a bad Christian. And it turns out that being distracted in prayer means that I'm just a human being, that human beings get distracted. And so when I come to God in prayer, I often have one simple phrase on my heart that I whisper to God, and it is, Jesus, here I am. Jesus, here I am. And when my mind gets distracted, you know, oh, the Mets are starting to play again. Oh, oh, Jesus, here I am, you know, or, or, or that person sent me an email that I didn't like and I'm finding myself getting anxious in the moment. I'm going to have to respond to that person. Oh, Jesus, here I am. As one guy said, is if, if our minds get distracted a thousand times in 10 minutes of prayer, it's a thousand opportunities to come back to Jesus. And wow. um, that's the way that I think we need to reframe it because if not, we will live it with deep shame and a sense of guilt that we don't measure up. We have to reframe distractions. We also have to normalize boredom. That, um, and by boredom, I mean that prayer is often uneventful in the moment. You don't really see what's happening in the moment. It's only when you look in retrospect, when you look at your past, you go, oh, wow, something has, has actually happened in my life. But if you're looking for change in the moment, you're going to be very frustrated. And so normalizing boredom, reframing distractions, uh, befriending silence, all these things are really important to cultivate a deep life with God in prayer. Yeah. One of the um, other practices that we've talked about before on the podcast is um, something that connects to healthy curiosity. We've talked about like a circle of affirmations where mm. students, um, they each get an index card and they write their name on the top and they pass it to like the right, the next person, right? And each person takes their turn writing an affirmation for the person whose name is on the card. Mm. And so at the end of the time, you have these cards full of affirmations of things that people see in you or the gifts that they see. Um, and so you get to feel good about you know what everyone is affirming you but also you you practice you put those muscles to work of like looking at other people and looking for um the talents that they bring and seeing them through the eyes of like how jesus sees them what you're expressing there in that practice is what we all long for we all long to be seen we all long to be built up. We all long to be encouraged. And we were made to do that for others as well. And um, I just find it to be a really beautiful practice that really gives expression to what Paul was getting at in the New Testament as well. Yeah. So if you've been listening to the podcast this season, you know that we have a lightning round. Lightning round. This is, a, yeah. this is not, I, I don't want to say that this is my favorite part of the of each episode but it is the fun part of each episode for me so um me okay. too <laughs> <laughs> so rich these questions are inspired by the questions that we asked um participants in the research that we did about these characteristics that we studied and there are no right or wrong answers these are entirely subjective uh, we're looking for the first thing that pops into your head one word or one sentence answers okay are you ready um, I think I am. <laughs> okay. When you were a teenager, who taught you most about love? My father. Okay. What is the greatest lesson you've learned about forgiveness? The greatest lesson I learned, uh, and if my father's listening to this, he's going to be really happy. I tell a story in one of my books of my father going to Puerto Rico to forgive his father, who he hadn't seen for 15 years uh, and he captured it in a story on Facebook. But yeah, his his forgiveness of his father was one of the greatest lessons I've ever seen. That's beautiful. In this season of your life, compassion looks like? Compassion looks like um, being patient with my children. 
<laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> That's a good one. What or who gives you hope? People in the generation we're talking about give me great hope about the future of the world, about the future of Christian life. So, uh, yeah, emerging generations for sure. So this is the make it or break it question, okay? This is what we've been building up to. Mm-hmm. And it's not a fair question, but it's a really fun question. <laughs> yes, yes. This on is scale- it. This is the moment. Yeah, this is the moment. <laughs> this, this is a moment. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low and 10 being high, how much humility do you have? Oh, my. Uh, today? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I feel like this is a trick question. But what, I, what I'm going to say, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give myself... I'm giving myself a six today. I'm giving myself a six today for sure. Yesterday, it was probably a, a, a one. Uh, but I'm giving myself a six today. I like and that. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Let me tell you why. Okay. Because, again, if humility is lack of defensiveness, my, my wife today pointed out that um, I've been leaving stuff around the kitchen too much, like these coffee cups, and I use a fork and I just leave it at some random place. And she's like, you know what? Can you just put the stuff where they belong? And I just said, and without any defensiveness in me, I said, absolutely, honey. I'm going to work really hard to do that. And I thought, that's pretty good. That's pretty. That was a pretty good response. So, uh, so it's a, so it's a six for me today. That's awesome. I- <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When something is hard, what is a practice that helps you persevere? For me, it's a practice of community. Uh, I, I meet with uh, three pastors the first Wednesday of each month. And one of the things is we process is what's hard. Uh, so for me, it's a practice of seeking out perspective and community. That's really helpful. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow, well, we, yeah. we got through them. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Woo. Survived. Yeah. Well, this is my other favorite uh, moment of the podcast. And, you know, this season, we're asking our podcast guests to help us wrap up each episode with a blessing. Um, so I have the privilege to ask you, Rich, in light of our conversation, can you give us a benediction? Yeah, what I'll, what I'll do is, uh, for those listening right now, maybe open your hands towards heaven. Uh, whenever we close our gatherings every Sunday at church in Queens, I offer a benediction uh, in light of the message that I've preached. And so this is what I say every Sunday, and I'll adapt the words. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this podcast conversation with a greater ability to cultivate humility, knowing that you are loved by an everlasting God who sees you and calls you beloved. And so may you have the ability and the capacity to lower your defenses in the service of love for your neighbor. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the kind invitation. (laughs) (laughs) This podcast is one of the many free resources produced by the Fuller Youth Institute. Check out the show notes for links to all the resources mentioned in today's episode. And here are some final thoughts from young people. My name is Debbie. I am 17 years old. Do you have any like thoughts about it or does a story come to mind? A story actually does come in mind. Um, in one of my class, this girl was like, she she wasn't humbling herself too much. She was like, oh, like you guys to go to the these stores or something more like for poor people. Like, uh, my mom pay, gives me money. My mom lets me buy whatever. Like, and her friend like had to pull her aside during our nutrition break and talk with her and like actually humble humble her because she didn't see what she was saying. It's so interesting that you mentioned that her friend talked to her. How do you think like friends help us be humble or like help us with humility? Because we think what we're saying sounds correct. But when we hear from a friend and we hear what we actually said, it's like, oh, I didn't meant it like that. Like we, we learn from different perspectives and our friends are like, hey, like that was messed up. You shouldn't be saying that. 
yeah. <laughs> can be really helpful sometimes when it comes to helping us be humble, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The reason I really like my youth leaders is because they still have authority over us, but also they seem to be, like, genuinely friends with us. Like, they're nice to us. They help us with our problems. We actually get along. But it doesn't feel like, you know, I'm smarter than you. I'm here to teach you about a subject. It's like, you know, hey, let's have this experience together. Let's, like, learn together. <laughs>